Hello, everyone. Before I forget to say this, good time to turn off your devices. I have to have mine on for like two more minutes so I know what time it is, but um, that we won't hear your ringtone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, it's so hot, I'm going to advertise the programs as being in here this summer. It surprised some of you to say, like, oh, it's not, we're not going to fall faint. We're going to actually be frosted. But it's a lot more tolerable to be in here. So um, there's a program tomorrow. I'm just going to make a brief mention of that. Um, formally introduce Mr. Ferguson, get out of the way. Um, but they will be in here. So if you like this, just the temperature, I know you'll like the program. Pass the word. Oh, actually, it's very tolerable in there. Because this place is known, Rachel Hottis has been here many times, and Shalom has been here many times. There probably many of you have, and it's like, it's a steam now. So it's a giant improvement. So we're proud of that. Uh, tomorrow night, there is a program here called Repeopling Vermont, The Paradox of Development in the 20th Century. I'm reading a bit of this because I have actually had a little bit of a hard time wrapping my head around this program. So Professor John Searles from Northern Vermont University will be here speaking about his book, Repeopling Vermont, which has to do with population changes in Vermont in the 20th century. And then there will be a community conversation, and please come back, about what's happening among population changes in Vermont now. So if you want to know what happened, um, we have copies of this book. And if you want to know what's going to happen, I think, come back and find out. So there's a lot of text on here, but I think I got the gist of it right there. Tomorrow night here, 7 p.m. I think that's everything I had to say before this. Um, you may have seen this excellent article. Have any of you read this about Mr. Fergus? Um, I'm going to read his introduction from his biography, so it's going to be totally familiar to him. And I'm leaving out a couple of things, because if you haven't read this, or, or you don't know him personally, um, it'll become evident why I'm leaving out something that was a big part of that article. Charles Fergus grew up in central Pennsylvania and graduated from Penn State University with a writing degree. He has worked as a writer and editor for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Penn State, and the Wildlife Management Institute. His articles and essays have appeared in publications as various as Audubon, New York Times, Country Journal, Highlights for Children, Iceland Review, Shooting Sportsman, Gray's Sporting Journal, and the Pennsylvania Game News. A Stranger Here Below is his 19th book. That was a revelation to me. Um, most of his other books are about nature and wildlife, and I listed a few here. The Wingless Crow, which is essay, uh, nature essays, Common Edible and Poisonous Mushrooms of the Northeast, Trees of Pennsylvania and the Northeast, Wildlife of Pennsylvania and the Northeast, and especially fitting for this year, Bear's Wild Guide. How many of you have seen a bear this year? F fewer than... I've lived here 20 years. I think I've seen one. This is the year to see bears. I haven't seen them. I'm jealous. Mr. Fergus says of himself, I like to read mysteries with compelling plots and believable characters, but in my experience, few mystery writers convey the real truth of murder. Today, I live in a part of Vermont known as the Northeast Kingdom. Um, I should have changed the wording here. Um, I'm speaking in his voice. My wife, writer Nancy Marie Brown, and I live on an old farm. We ride our Icelandic horses on dirt roads and trails. He is a member of a hospice chorus, and I sing in small groups, bringing a cappella music to people in their last days and final hours. Did you sing here? Did you sing here? Um, yes, we did. Yes. Correct. Upstairs. Yes. He says of himself, I am also one third of the Appalachian root trio called Yestermorn. We sing Appalachian folk and shape note songs, including many from the early 1800s, the kind of powerful spiritual music that would have set Sheriff Gideon Stoltz's wounded soul soaring again. Please welcome Charles Fergus. Thank you very much. I feel like I've really arrived because one of the first places that my wife and I visited when we came to the Northeast Kingdom to look around, to think about moving here, 
back in the year 2001 uh, was the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum, and we were both blown away by the ambiance, the quality of the art, the friendliness of the people. We thought, this is a great place. We want to be here. And we were fortunate enough to be able to find a place uh, where we have made our home now for the last 15, 16 years. Um, let me check right now one thing. Are you all hearing me well enough? Yeah. Okay. Is it too loud or too good? Bob, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I will get started here, put you in the place and the time. It's 1835 in Adamant, Pennsylvania. A 22-year-old sheriff named Gideon Stoltz faces his first real challenge when his friend and mentor, the respected judge Hiram Biddle, commits suicide. Gideon is new to town. He was recently promoted from deputy to sheriff after the county sheriff who hired him died unexpectedly from a stroke of apoplexy. Gideon is also Pennsylvania Dutch in the backcountry Scotch-Irish settlement. Gideon's quest to learn why Judge Biddle killed himself takes him down a dangerous path into the town's past. Soon, a murder rocks adamant. Is it linked in some way to the judge's death? As Gideon investigates, he must relive the trauma of his own mother's murder, a crime that remains unsolved. You may be wondering why I decided to write a mystery set in 1835 in central Pennsylvania. The setting was pretty easy. I wanted to write a novel about the place where I was born and grew up. Although I no longer live in central Pennsylvania, I know the land and its people and the nature of both. Central Pennsylvania is marked by long parallel valleys with good limestone soil separated one from another by long parallel mountain ridges mostly wooded and capped with resistant sandstone rock. It's an appealing mix of farmland and forest, of settled places and wild terrain. It may not be as striking as some other landscapes, but it's intricate and full of surprises. A friend once said in comparing the Rocky Mountains with the Pennsylvania uplands, those mountains are spectacular but these mountains you can live in. Why 1835? You might say it's because of the old iron furnaces, the weathered stone pyramids that dot the landscape of central Pennsylvania. They caught my eye and piqued my curiosity when I was growing up. They stand along roads like silent monuments to the past. They hide, tucked away in the forest. Once, they gouted smoke and yielded great quantities of pig iron. The heyday of the charcoal-fired iron industry was in the early 1800s, and central Pennsylvania, with its abundant wood, ore, limestone, and water power, was a key iron-making region. Many writers have set novels during the American Revolution. Many other novels take place around the time of the Civil War. Yet some scholars consider the period between those two events to be the richest in American history and the time when the foundations of the modern United States were being laid. Our young nation was flexing its muscles and finding its identity. Waking Giant is what the historian David S. Reynolds called his seminal book about America in the early 19th century. It must have been a fascinating and sometimes a harrowing time to have been alive. 
Andrew Jackson was president between the years 1829 and 1837. Also known as Old Hickory, he carried around a pistol ball lodged near his heart, the souvenir of a duel he had fought as a younger man. That was one of at least 10 duels and maybe as many as 100 duels that the hot-headed Jackson took part in. In the South, planters grew cotton using the labor of African slaves. Jackson himself was a slave owner. Settlers advanced westward. Wisconsin, Iowa, and Texas were on the frontier. A period of religious zeal known as the Second Great Awakening had seized the nation. Circuit preachers rode from town to town conducting revival services. They depicted heaven as a paradise to which all true believers could ascend, not just the so-called elect foreordained by God to achieve eternal bliss, as people had been taught in the past. Those same revival preachers also described the terrors of hell to frighten sinners into accepting Christ. Western New York was known as the burned over district because of all the fire and brimstone spouted there. America in the 1830s was a ferment of new ideas. Controversy raged over religion, foreign immigration, prison reform, the prohibition of alcohol, free education, a growing inequality of wealth, increasing urbanization, who should have the right to vote, and that overarching and hugely incendiary issue, slavery. Technology was on the rise. New machines cleaned cotton and wove it into cloth. Steam power sent boats chugging up rivers and railroad engines huffing down the tracks. You can come on in and sit up front if you'd like. You get the aid Yeah, come on. The steel plow, the mechanical reaper, percussion, ignition, and repeating firearms, the telegraph, the bicycle, the sewing machine, and the daguerreotype photograph all arrived on the scene. Yet in many ways, the early 1800s remained a primitive era. Doctors were often illiterate and had no idea of how disease arose or how to cure it. A family might lose all of its children to the bloody flux, dysentery, in a few days. Yellow fever, tuberculosis, cholera, smallpox, typhus, and influenza killed thousands each year. Many people believed that disease was God's flail, his way of punishing sinners and unbelievers. In lightly settled regions, roads were little more than traces cut through the woods, with tree trunks chopped off just below wagon axle height. Wagoners, peddlers, and drovers moved about with their freight and wares, their herds and flocks. Others were on the move too. On both sides of the Mason-Dixon line, people might encounter escaping slaves and pursuing slave catchers. Northerners listened to scathing lectures by traveling abolitionists who sometimes got tarred and feathered for their views. Small towns might be visited by freak shows, spirit communicators, elocutionists, mesmerists, operatic performers, and teachers of shape note singing. The title of my novel, The Stranger Here Below, comes from a shape note hymn, a striking and distinctive form of American music popular in the early 1800s. I hope that my book will be the first in a series of mysteries, all of which I plan to title using lyrics from shape note hymns. Shape note music is serious stuff. 
Its harmonies are unusual. Hymns were often sung in the minor mode. They dealt with topics that were on people's minds. The fragility and perilousness of life, God and salvation, heaven and hell. I'd like to read a passage from a stranger here below. This section comes after the young sheriff Gideon Stoltz finds the body of Judge Hiram Biddle killed by his own hand. Gideon, his wife True, and their infant son David go to their church for a hymn singing in the shape note style. The Methodist church was a low log building. Inside, tallow candles gave off a pungent smell and a wavering light. Forty people filled the church. They picked up the oblong tune books and sat down on benches made from split logs. Gideon sat with the tenors. True, holding David, sat to his right with the trebles. On the tenors left were the basses, and on the opposite side of the hollow square sat the counters. The lead tenor announced the first song, Idumea. He pitched the starting notes up and down the scale, and the singers tuned in, the sound swelling as the parts found their places. The high trebles, the lower notes of the counters, the grave voices of the basses, and above them the higher tones of the tenors, all blending into one sonorous, trembling chord. The harmony was raw in the minor mode, utterly different from the predictable, mellifluous Hochdeutsch hymns of Gideon's childhood. The congregation had been singing this new music for over a year, ever since a singing master had come down from New York and taught them to read the music. Gideon enjoyed the strange and unexpected harmonies. He often found himself humming or singing the songs later, when splitting firewood or working at his desk or riding somewhere on his horse. The hymn's poetry, their lyrics, never failed to move him. Each song, it seemed, had the power to inspire him or terrify him or uplift him or wound him. Some of them made him recall things he didn't want to remember, like his memmy's death. With his hand, the leader beat out the tempo. The people sang out fa and soul and la and me, voicing the syllables of the differently shaped notes, triangles, ovals, squares, and diamonds printed in the books. The second time through, they launched into the words. Mm -hmm. And am I born to die to feet tramping the floor. A land of deepest shade, unpierced by human thought, the dreary regions of the dead, where all things are forgot. The words pierced Gideon's own heart. He thought of Hiram Biddle's soul wandering restlessly in the dreary regions of the dead with no hope of entering into the light of God's saving grace. Soon as from earth I go The 
judge had committed suicide, his portion must be eternal woe. Yet Gideon prayed that Hiram Biddle's soul might somehow find salvation. Waked by the trumpet sound, I from my grave shall rise and see the judge with glory crowned and see the flaming skies. This judge was God in all his power. On the day of redemption, those who had kept the faith would rise from their graves and join him. The voices filled the church as the people sang the repeat, belting out again those final awful words, and see the judge with glory crowned, and see the flaming skies. Gideon could almost see the heavens red with fire, hear them crackling from one horizon to the other but his mind stayed stubbornly earthbound. By killing himself, Judge Biddle had spurned the gift that God had given. There had to be some reason for him to have taken an action so dire. Was it something that he'd buried and tried to forget, only to have it emerge anew? Something evil or scandalous or grievously sad? Gideon made up his mind to learn the reason why. He would look and ask and listen and figure out what had caused Hiram Biddle to throw away his life on earth and in heaven everlasting. I'm going to take a little break for a glass of water here. So, why did I decide to write a mystery novel? A simple answer is that I like to read mysteries, and I thought it would be fun and challenging to write one. Good mysteries are emotionally absorbing. Their plots are taught and carefully crafted. They move right along, and they end up somewhere. Some people are prejudiced against mysteries including more than a few of the teachers I had when I was earning a degree in writing at Penn State University in the 1970s. Those professors of creative writing dismissed mysteries as formulaic, as genre fiction. They suggested that mysteries could be neither literary nor profound. Many years later, I asked one of my old teachers, a good friend with whom I'd kept in touch, what he'd been reading lately. All I read these days is trash, he told me. Question further, he admitted that he read mysteries. <laughs> Can a mystery be thoughtful, literary, profound? A good mystery offers rich and complex characters. It evokes a strong sense of place. Like any good novel, it conveys the beauty and the power of language. If it's set in the past, it teaches us about history, painlessly, as we keep turning pages, caught up in a story, wanting to learn what happens next. A good mystery deals with important issues and timeless truths. Most mysteries include murder, and they revolve around characters who must confront horrific crimes. Murder is, after all, a real human phenomenon. Murder happens to people, sometimes even to people we know. In September 1995, my mother, Ruth Fergus, a widow in her 70s, surprised a burglar in her home in State College, Pennsylvania. He stabbed her to death. I found her body. When I decided to write a novel that included murder, I wanted to depict as honestly as I could the reality of what happens when a human being takes another person's life. 
In my opinion, murder is not something to write about lightly. I don't read the kind of mysteries known as cozies, in which killings are downplayed or even treated with humor. And it bothers me when, in a mainstream mystery, an author knocks off characters with no thought or acknowledgement given to how those deaths affect others, family members, friends, communities, and the people who must investigate those murders. The main character of A Stranger Here Below is a young sheriff of Pennsylvania Dutch extraction. I wrote several drafts of the novel and was not fully satisfied with Gideon Stoltz as a character. Then someone whom I'd asked to read the story and who knew my personal history made a courageous suggestion. Draw on your own past and give Gideon the experience of having lost his mother to murder. At first I resisted. Creating for Gideon that kind of painful backstory would mean that I would have to revisit and in some ways relive losing my mother to a particularly cruel and violent death. Then I thought about how important truth and honesty are to the writing of good fiction. I'll read another passage from a stranger here below. And after that, I'd be glad to have a discussion with you, try to answer any questions that you might have about me or my writing. In this section, Sheriff Gideon Stoltz is on his way to a remote mountain hollow to visit his wife's grandmother. He wants to ask her about a trial and hanging that took place 30 years ago in 1805 and that he suspects may be connected to Judge Hiram Biddle's recent suicide. What I'll read is actually a flashback as Gideon recalls something that happened two years earlier when he rode his mare, Maud, out of settled southeastern Pennsylvania and into the backwoods of central Pennsylvania. One day, a man fell in with him at a crossroads. The tattered man, for that was how Gideon had thought of him ever since, rode a big black mule. He said he was a preacher and dug out of his saddlebag a Bible whose cover was as worn and shiny as his coat. He aimed the, bu the book at Gideon, sighting along the spine. I will not sermonize at you, he said, for I can see that you are a man who knows his Redeemer liveth. The tattered man grinned, revealing broken brown teeth. You show the inner light, he said, even if you are a blamed Dutchman. The way climbed past walls of lichen-scabbed rock. It wound among thick-trunked oaks and pines with huge spiky cones. At the top of the ridge, the tattered man halted his mule. Before them, the mountains lay jammed together, the rugged terrain covered with forest. Gideon could see the green rounded tops of the hardwood trees occupying the slopes, the darker green spires of hemlocks jutting up from the stream bottoms. Ridge followed ridge to the horizon. The view made him think of a great green blanket laid down on trash and rubble. A proverb came to him, vis land so delight as the land, so the people. The seven mountains, the tattered man said, Patty and long and thick, and some others which I don't know their names, or if they even got names, the man intoned. The seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. His face, grimy and unshaven, assumed a genial smile. The woman being the horror of Babylon. Revelations, chapter 17. He continued, his voice swelling until he roared like a revival preacher. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. He fell silent, winked at Gideon. Get ye up, mule, he said. He boot-heeled his mule once, twice, and on the third wallop, the big twitch-eared beast commenced walking again. The trail switched back down into the wooded valley. 
As they descended, the tattered man told story after story. He once shot a panther just as it sprang at him, the ball striking the cat in the open mouth and the varmint fell dead at his feet with its whiskers touching his boot. He nearly smothered when the well he was digging caved in and he lay there with the cold clay stopping up his mouth, listening to people screaming and hollering as they worked to dig him out and a bright light shone before his eyes. The word of God entered into him and his whole being was filled with peace. Right then he knew he would follow the Lord. The tattered man explained how he and his brother had stood a donkey on planks and put him to a big plow mare to make this mule. His people had always rode mules instead of horses on account of mules were smarter and stronger and had more staying power. When Gideon could get a word in, he asked if the tattered man was going all the way to Adamant. He'd heard it was a go-ahead town, a place where a man could find work, make a new start. And he was intrigued by the name. It meant unshakable, steadfast, determined, just as he was determined to make of himself something more than a digger in the dirt, a tiller of the land. Adam, the tattered man said, well, of course I'm going there with you. Wouldn't be a Christian thing to do now, would it, to leave you here alone in this wilderness? As if divining Gideon's thoughts, the tattered man said, you could turn tail right now, Dutch, and head back to wherever it is you are from. I won't tell you no lie, there's peril amongst these ridges. Wolves and panthers and bears as common as barnyard fowl. Rattlesnakes and copperheads ready to strike out and poison your horse. Wildfires that can burn you up, floods that can sweep you away. And there's bad men like William Jewell Jarrett. You heard of him? Gideon shook his head. Where do you come from you have not heard tell of William Jewell Jarrett? Gideon thought about where he did come from. He pictured the fertile fields sectioned off by rail fences, big red barns and whitewashed slat-sided tobacco sheds and stone-built houses with hollyhocks next to the door and peach and cherry and apple orchards and creaking mills along each stream and graded roads that went orderly from farm to farm and all at once he was more homesick than he had ever imagined he could be. The tattered man reined in his mule. He chuckled, looked sidelong at Gideon. Speak of the devil, he said, and his horns appear. From the brush next to the trail in front of them stepped a gray horse. Its rider wore a brimmed hat with a low crown, a butternut blouse, and a long unbuttoned duster. Above a hooked nose, the man's eyes showed as much emotion as a copperhead's. The tattered man walked his mule up to the gray. The mule touched horses with, excuse me, the mule touched noses with the horse, whimpered softly, and passed along to stand beside the horse, facing in the opposite direction. Maud flicked her ears back, and Gideon glanced over his shoulder. Another horse and rider had emerged from the brush behind them. The horse stood sideways across the trail. In his hand, the rider held a sword with a long blade. Oh, once I had a glorious view, sang the tattered man in an off-key baritone, of my redeeming Lord. Beneath Gideon, Maud started to dance. Jesus Christus, money they would want, though he had precious little. My God has me of late forsook. He's gone, I know not where. The tattered man whooped out a laugh. They would take Maud. Yes, they would take her, and they would take his life. His heart hammered and he felt a liquid warmth fill his chest. He closed his hands on the reins and thought, go. And Maud shot forward, her iron shod hooves clanging on rock. The highwayman's hand whipped across his body, grabbing for a pistol at his belt. As Maud spurted between the skittering gray horse and the stolid black mule, Gideon felt his knees slam into both men's legs. Maud lunged and they were through. She pounded down the trail. He dug his fingers into her mane and leaned forward on her fast flexing back. He heard a deep boom and a yowl past his head like an angry hornet and another boom. 
The top of Maud's ear suddenly vanished. Onward she ran. <laughs> So I'd be very happy to talk with you and have a conversation. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, for coming out on this muggy, uh, not too lively evening, but I really appreciate having this many people here and seeing you all and many friends and many other people who I've not met. Uh, but again, thank you for coming. Yes. So. At these readings, you always get to hear the finished product. And I, <laughs> I'm really interested in the process. And so I, 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 I looked up your book, I have it, I've read it and I very much enjoyed it, as you know. Um, your first sentence, I'm just wondering, was that one that you changed multiple times or did it come and it stayed from the beginning? For example, I mean, that's just. The first one sentence thing. in the presentation of the book. In the book. What was the first sentence in the book? Gideon Stoltz stood in the darkness, shotgun in his hands. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that was a relatively new addition mm -hmm. because um, a little bit of background information. Can you go back to the mic? Okay. okay. <laughs> so the first sentence, Gideon stood in the darkness. Shotgun in his hands. Gideon stood in the darkness, shotgun in his hand. Um, when I wrote the manuscript for A Stranger Here Below, I did not have an agent because my agent, who I had used for years, had died. And so I'd been writing other books that didn't require an agent. Uh, and I was faced with finding a new agent. And that's not an easy task uh, right now. I was lucky enough to get an agent, um, and I sent her the manuscript after I had met her at a uh, conference of the Historical Novel Society when I had a 15-minute sit-down chat with her. You know, you get to do your elevator pitch and all that. It's like speed dating, right? Um, so I sent her the manuscript, and she read it, and she said, I really like it. I want to represent it. It's not what I expected. Oh, okay. Um, but she says, I think you need to have a new beginning. The beginning that I'd had originally uh, featured the uh, woman who kept house for the judge, finding Judge Biddle having committed suicide and then going and getting Gideon Stoltz to come investigate. My agent said, let, let your main character make this astonishing discovery on his own. And I think it was really good advice. So it's a relatively new sentence. I didn't agonize over it. I just wrote it. I sent it to her, and she said, yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff? Can you talk a little more about the Pennsylvania Dutch and the kind of relationship with the community there? And, and, yeah, Jeff's question was, can I talk a little bit more about the Pennsylvania Dutch, the Pennsylvania Dutch? Um, Fergus is a Scotch-Irish name. My forebears came through Pennsylvania uh, back in the 1700s. Um, they were a footloose tribe. They went farther and farther west. And um, so my being born in Pennsylvania was kind of a, an interesting stroke. Um, but I grew up in a town called State College, which was a an interesting mix of uh, kids who came from farm families, kids who came from mining families, kids who came from merchants' families, and kids who were professors' uh, sons and daughters. And uh, a lot of the people who lived locally were Pennsylvania German. And we didn't think anything of it, honestly, uh, at least I don't. I don't know, I know that I didn't, I don't think too many others did. Um, when I read uh, about Pennsylvania in the early 1800s, I discovered that it took a while for uh, the Scotch-Irish and the Pennsylvania Germans to 
come to appreciate one another's skills and cultures. And um, tension propels fiction. And I wanted to have that tension from the beginning. My main character, Gideon Stoltz, marries uh, a young woman of Scotch-Irish background. And so he's not particularly accepted by her family. In fact, because they, he, he ran off with her, they really kind of want to beat the snot out of him if they can. But that kind of tension, I think, really uh, helps to pick up a reader's interest and helps to, helps to keep a story moving. Um, I went to college uh, and my roommate was named Earl Schreckengast. He came from a little valley in central Pennsylvania. He was fond of saying, I am, I, I am my own second cousin. <laughs> um, Schreckengast, uh, of course, very German name and uh, many of the names of the people. I mean, when I, when I go to find names for characters, all I have to do is open up a phone book from central Pennsylvania and take my pick. But the Pennsylvania German culture is very rich and they were very farming oriented. They were very good husbands of the soil. Um, they were very good uh, at rotating crops and doing many things that um, Scotch-Irish farmers had not done. And so they were able to move into areas, buy up tired farmland for a cheap price, very often pooling their resources as a congregation or as a family. Um, and then take these old tired farms and really make them, make them fertile and productive again. Yes, sir. How is, uh, or has your writing changed since you've come up here? Um, are you, you know, could you imagine writing a mystery about Caledonia? Um, you know, I think I have. I think I have my character here. I have a character I want to stick with, Gideon Stoltz. He's a young man. Um, the place is my place. It's where I come from. It's really the place of my heart. I, I don't go, uh, I, don't, I don't suppose a year passes when I don't get back to Pennsylvania. Those, those ridges and valleys just really uh, are imprinted uh, in my soul. And, um, I think I'll stay there. But I did steal the name Adamant from Vermont. Yeah. Anybody know of Adamant, Vermont? Eight houses, right? Something like eight houses, yeah, I would guess. I saw that name on a map and I thought, oh man, that's a perfect name for this town that I want my main character to end up in. I love the second passage that you read because I didn't see that coming. And when I'm reading mysteries, I'm a skeptical reader thinking, all right, at some point, the plot is going to hinge on something phony, something that doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm always reading mysteries to, think, to see if I'm going to trust the author all the way through. And in that section, I didn't know where they were going. I thought, it was, yeah, it's moving the story along. I didn't see that. It was a setup. So I really did love that. I haven't finished the book, so I'm wondering if you mentioned why True's name is True and all her brother's names begin with J? Yeah. And if you do, don't tell me. <laughs> well, you know, you've heard of the bad card and a busted flush, haven't you? OK. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, you talk about being ejected from a mystery, you know, by something that doesn't ring true or by, and in fact, this, that particular incident doesn't really um, spring up again in the story. And it, but I've had different readers say, the tattered man who, you know, who gulled Gideon into this ambush, when's he coming back? They expected him to come back throughout the whole book, but he never did. So, but that's the way life is sometimes, you know. Maybe he'll come back in a future, uh, Gideon Stoltz mystery. <laughs> Anybody else? Woody. Um, one of the things that I kept being uh, really uh, almost excited by, uh, and you know, words are think, something I'm interested in, is how you would choose a word to describe some action, and I would instantly say, that's exactly the way it happens. 
And I just never even would have thought to express it quite that way. And it's something about the horse and the way the horse felt as you rode on it or something like that, things that you know a lot about. He had fabulous insight into um, just what is going on at a, at a certain moment. And that includes also uh, the, the, um, the reactions of uh, people uh, discovering the, the, the murdered victim and the, the impact it has on other people. I mean, the depth of your insight there is uh, very welcome in the book, I think. Well, thank you very much. Um, I am a horseback rider. Uh, you know, one of the things that both my wife and I get really pissed at is when we're reading something about horses and riding and the, and the writer just gets it wrong. Like, she saw the, the, uh, the bandits coming and knew she had to get out of here, so she kicked the horse in the withers. Does anybody know what the withers are on a horse? It's right up here on the horse's, top of the horse's shoulders. And for you to kick a horse in the withers would re require such a feat of acrobatic skill, it is just impossible to imagine. But no, you know, things can, writers uh, try to keep the reader in this fictional dream. They try to, um, hold on to the reader's attention and emotions. And the more things that you do that may eject the reader from this fictional dream, the less likely you are to have written a successful story. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing that just makes you throw the book across the room, or if it's a library book, set it gently on the desk, you know, and not read it anymore. <laughs> Jeff, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just wondering, I mean, your, your introductory piece is so rich as well in terms of the history. Uh, it sounds like you have a lot of material there. Mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on how that's going? And you know, it's really interesting because I don't even really exactly remember why I decided to set this story in, 18, in the 1830s. It was, I knew it was, I knew I wanted to write during a time when uh, Pennsylvania had been kind of passed over by that initial wave of settlement, and yet it was still very much a frontier in certain important ways. And the more I read about this period, the more fascinated uh, I became in it. It's just really a, I mean, and it's true in Vermont too, it was a very fascinating time all through uh, the United States. You know, all of these controversies were raging that suddenly it sounded really familiar even today, you know, things like, uh, um, you know, uh, distribution of wealth and, and immigration and, and uh, from foreign countries and who should have the right to vote, prison reform. These are all still important and thorny issues today. So I was just mesmerized by that period. And, and uh, the more I learned about it, uh, the more I thought, it's, it's an uncharted period. It hasn't been written about much. There are more books now nowadays coming out about it, but um, I was just happy to have found it and, and to be able to immerse myself in it. It's one of the beauties of writing historical fiction is you get to do all this research. And, um, um, but you know, in the end, you still have to tell a story. You can't bog down in the research, but you have to get it right. Oh, yeah. Yes, I think about the the uh, the others, the the coke ovens that you said were in the area where you grew up. All the, all the, the to uh, make pig iron. The iron making, uh, the, the iron furnaces. Yeah, when did that start? Um, the reason I mentioned it is because my wife's. Mother's grandmother would bring her daughter to music lessons in the next valley over it. And if they took the main road, they'd pass by the ovens that were, it was <coughs> they were just hard to breathe. So they took a road over the mountain to get to where the music lesson was. But that would have been in the 1870s. 
the, the pig iron industry, uh, iron industry existed in, um, in the colonies well before the revolution. And, uh, you know, of course, it, they made implements of war during the revolution using these furnaces and foundries and um, furnaces and forges, I should say. Um, furnaces were where they melted iron ore and then ran it out into, uh, into a, a sand casting floor that had a, a large central um, pit that was dug. And then off of it at intervals were smaller side channels that became ingots. And the overall uh, appearance of this shape was that of a sow nursing a litter of piglets, and that's how why it was called pig iron. So in other words, fun facts that you get to find out while you're when you're doing research. Any more questions? Thoughts? They can be irreverent. You working on the next one? You said that. I am working on oh, good. I am working on the next one about three quarters of the way through with it, through a manuscript. But then I have to send it to my agent, see what my agent says. Rebecca? Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm just kind of thinking that I don't want to talk about the ending for those that haven't read the book, but I'm wondering whether when you create something like that, whether you have a type of ending in mind when you write the book, or whether that somehow, you know, it, it just evolves as you write it. I know that as I write fiction, I have an ending in mind, and I write toward that ending. And I, I know I do for this particular story that I'm working on right now. I had another novel published back in 1991. That was my first uh, novel. That was also a historical novel, and for that one, too, I remember very specifically, I knew what the ending would be um, when I started to write the book. Potential of future books. I mean, do you have this bigger picture in mind? That yeah, the you know a series has its own arc, um, and I have a I have an interesting dilemma that I face, and that is that in reality, in in, in history, in Pennsylvania, sheriffs were only allowed to serve for three years. Um, it was an elected office; it was not appointed. Now Gideon is filling out the term of a, um, his predecessor who died, and Gideon was, you know, kind of suddenly thrust into the position of being the acting sheriff. But he's coming up for election in this work, book that I'm working on right now, and if he gets elected, he's got three more years, so, you know, several more mysteries, but what happens then? <laughs> so I, I toyed with the idea of, okay, well, let's see, I'll just sort of suspend reality and I'll add in a an end note that even though historically sheriffs in Pennsylvania were only allowed to serve for three years, I'm going to break that rule. But no, I see somebody shaking her head no. Um, and actually, if you think about it, there are really good ways of getting around that little situation, such as what if the new sheriff who replaces Gideon Stoltz is a corrupt person? and People are asking Gideon, you know, something something really bad happened here. Can you help us out? Then he's got to work against not just a you know a criminal, but also against the powers that be. You just run for Congress in 1835. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's I don't think it's in the cards. Although at the time, five governors in a row in Pennsylvania were Pennsylvania German. There was a huge voting block. They were Democrats. They also voted, uh, helped to swing Pennsylvania for Andrew Jackson. The Pennsylvania Germans were really, you know, he was a common man, the common man's president. And Pennsylvania Germans were, you know, they were, they were farmers. They were not, I mean, they were, they were professionals too, but uh, by and large, most of them were, were farm people. And so they were interested in, in um, things that would help the common man rather than necessarily things that would help uh, industry. Yes? 
He spoke about fiction being a, or a fictional dream and casting that spell for your reader. Coming from publishing so much nonfiction, what aspects of imagination and historical research, the balance between imagining something that is a dream to you, what aspects of your imagination and truth do you bring to fiction from your background in nonfiction, and how do you find that play, and how do you find uh, the experience of creating a, a dream for, for people through that? You know, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, I think that if a writer has respect for his or her reader, um, the writer will place in front of the reader those facts that cause the writer to have a certain viewpoint or um, draw a certain conclusion. And then the writer will trust the reader to draw that same conclusion. So I, I think that the uh, accretion of honest facts uh, really helps to, to build that fictional dream and allow the reader to experience it directly rather than being, it's the, it's the show, don't tell um, approach to writing. So if you show the reader you know, in, in, I like to use often fairly simple declarative sentences. If you show the reader the scene that you are imagining, then um, I think there's a good chance that that reader will, will get that scene. Um, from a practical point of view, you know, I know a lot about wildlife and I lo know a lot about nature and, um, and the landscape of Pennsylvania. And so I was able to draw on that knowledge to, to uh, create this world, this fictional world. Does that inform your uh, being able to live in the dream yourself while writing it, that uh, wildlife background? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I would, I, I can, wildlife and nature, you know, I can really sort of feel the place and get a sense of what sights, sounds, smells the characters might experience if they were in that same setting. Do you find your wildlife uh, background or the books that you've published, is that educational and what aspect of writing a mystery that incorporates violence and murder that has touched your life? Uh, do you find educational about the educating people in empathy and humanizing violence? Well, I think that, I think that, um, you know, any writer who tries to write honestly about any subject has the hope that, uh, that they will educate a reader. So whether it's about violence or, or about, um, you know, hunting, hunting grouse with flintlock shotguns in, in 1835, you just hope that if you present um, the details properly that you'll uh, have the uh, reaction that you desire in the reader. I do, I wanted to mention too, I do have a, a new book out called Make a Home for Wildlife. It's a very, very different book from A Stranger Here Below. Uh, Nonfiction book, a how-to book, really. It's uh, aimed at um, encouraging and educating people who own land to do things on their land to make, uh, make it more welcoming to wildlife, whether it's your backyard or 150 acres. So it's the other side of the coin for, for my writing. The last question that's not going to lead to a 15 minute discussion. <laughs> last question then. Okay. okay. I'll do the book end or something. I, I, I think I heard you say that you're partway through your new manuscript and when you finish your manuscript, it's going off to your agent. Do you not take your first draft and edit it yourself? Do you just I've been editing this so many times as I go through it constantly. But actually, I'm wondering, so you, you do it in, in course of the writing? Uh, yeah, I, I rewrite and uh, edit as I, as I go along. And actually, that was a, 
a little bit of, uh, of an oversimplification because I will have, uh, I will let my wife read it. She's a very good reader. Um, I'll probably let two or three uh, friends who are good writers and good readers also read it and I'll react, I'll, I'll listen to what they have to say and then I'll send it probably to an agent. You were going to ask a question, right? Yeah, um, you writing from a, a historical perspective from so far, so long ago, do you kind of find yourself immersed in that world? I mean, do you sometimes wish you could be writing about something newer, or, you know, maybe you, know, you could leave that series growing, growing up here? Or, I mean, I, 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 I did one with a 200 year old scene in a scenario in, in, in a book, and the, the research I had to do, I mean, you didn't live in 1835, so you've got to research almost every aspect of life. Every, I mean, from food to clothing to, to the way they live, it's, it's quite a project. Yes. <laughs> Denise, who's here in the audience, friend of mine, Denise Brown, she's also a writer. She and I were recently at a, um, at a uh, conference in Washington, D.C. for the Historical Novel Society, which is the um, organization through which I was lucky enough to get an agent. And we heard a speaker um, who has a successful novel right now called Wenches uh, about uh, women in slavery. And one of the things she talked about was just this, you know, the amount of research that you can do. But then she finally said, but you know what? In the end, you just got to make shit up. <laughs> so. But, but do you, I don't feel that you're someone who does it. I think, I, I, from what you've read, you're often, I mean, it just feels like you did your research. I think I did do my research. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't. I haven't. Had, and you know, for instance, in the iron making thing, I had a, a person who's an iron making ex expert go over it in great detail. So I tried to make it very, very true to the age and to the and to the reality of 1835. So I believe that if anyone would like to um, buy books, I'd be happy to sign them. That. Uh, Boxcar and Caboose is here tonight, and we can have more conversations uh, then as well.